achieving safe and secure supply chain ops. To uh, take this panel ahead, I would like to introduce our moderator for the session, Mr. R.G. Panikar, Managing Director at Dangerous Goods Management India. Mr. R.G. is the Managing Director of uh, Dangerous Good Management, which is established in 2005. DGM is a niche specialized dangerous goods logistics and compliance services company. It also provides DG transport regulatory training, consulting and audit. He is a certified DG trainer and expert. He has worked as MDCO position in various companies such as Cargo Service Center India, Delhi Cargo Service Center, RG's postgraduate diploma in business management from XLRI Jamshedpur and holds Bachelor of Science from St. Xavier College, Ahmedabad. Put your hands together for our moderator for the second panel, please. Sunny on stage. I would like to call on stage now for our panel for the day. Uh, Mr. Arush Kishore, VP Integrated Operations, Liquid and Gas at Reliance Industries. Mr. Uh, Rajiv Kadam, VP Supply Operations. He is not, he is not there. Mr. Dhritiman Chakraborty, Director of Operations, Indra Mitro. Mr. Vishal Sharma, Regional Supply Chain Manager, ISC at Indorama Ventures, Oxides, and NK. And Mr. Puri Agrawal, Founder at Freight Shop. Sir, I would like now you take the response call. Can we have a big round of applause for the panelists, please? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I know our panel is between you and the lunch. Uh, and we don't want to really uh, uh, keep you waiting, so let's get uh, quickly uh, on board this panel. Uh, very quickly, uh, I'll ask my panel to introduce themselves. Just one sentence. I think more, there are a lot of questions to be asked and uh, uh, have the panel moving forward. So, uh, we'll start with you. Arush after the integrated liquid and gas function, it's integrated between road and ship. Hello everyone, uh, this is uh, Dhritiman, Dhritiman Chakravarti. I am from Ingram Micro. So we are a global IT distribution company. I take care of operations in Ingram Micro. Thank you. Good afternoon everyone. I'm Shashir Sahib, founder of Spectrum Supply Chain for Indorama Ventures, a chemical company having almost 22 years of experience in the chemical industries. Good afternoon everyone, I'm Puneet Agarwal, I'm founder of Tretron. I have almost 22 years of experience in logistics, heading one of the India's largest transportation companies called CJ Rasul Logistics. I'm very proud that uh, many of the Delta members, they are our esteemed customers, so they are happy to share my five points. Great. Great. As India uh, raises to become a $5 trillion economy, uh, obviously uh, a lot of issues comes up uh, when we talk about supply chain. The two important one of them, there have been a lot of other discussion as well as to what is critical. But uh, two important things that this panel is going to discuss is security and uh, safety. Security, when we talk about, it always implies chemical, chemical security because the hazardous uh, nature of the product that has been uh, moved around, but secure safety also involves other product as well. But what is less understood is the security aspect in the supply chain. Uh, it is no longer the chowkidari business that we have some guards guarding some uh, facility, but it's all about uh, securing our assets, our products, uh, making, making sure that we are, uh, people are not hijacked, our goods are not hijacked. Yesterday, somebody was talking that I still do not know whether my goods are going to reach the destination. Okay, I'm, if that is true, because this was the story, uh, 15 years back when we say 15% of the truck moving on Indian roads do not know where they uh, disappear. So if that is still there, it is now becoming an increasingly major security threat because, uh, because of the reasons of counterfeit, uh, kidnapping, uh, terrorist activity and stuff like that. So this panel is going to talk about all those issues which are 
uh, there as far as safety and security are concerned in the supply chain. I'll start with Arush. Arush, what are the most important, critical safety uh, risk and challenges that is there in your industry? Because I think you are in that place where you know what gets really uh, uh, feeling uh, what you call fear when you step into those refineries, manufacturing huge amount of different complex chemicals. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, we of course move uh, some of the most hazardous product uh, in, in, in uh, across uh, our space, both inbound and outbound, both uh, inbound and outbound. Um, I think uh, the risks are pretty much well known. Uh, if, we, if we take, uh, if we can start with the environment, uh, risk to the environment, we can uh, drill it down to life, we can drill it down to health, we can drill it down to financial losses, risk to reputation, and what have you. Uh, but there's a less understood uh, piece to not looking at uh, safety, and this is bringing out of uh, experience some of it advised by you, uh, which is that all of us are at, uh, at least we believe, we are at a we are at a curve where every safety initiative that we take releases efficiency and therefore leads to uh, cost competitiveness vis-a-vis uh, competition. Uh, follow-up question to you. Uh, he's talked about compliance. So what role does compliance with safety regulation and standard play, play in mitigating supply chain risk? And how can organizations ensure they stay uh, updated with the evolving safety requirements? You know that India is now coming up with new standards. Uh, you have the new safety chemical code and you have the IS standard on uh, dangerous goods in warehouse and all that. So what is your uh, take on that? So compliance plays an important role and I would say that uh, India is actually lagging behind in terms of compliance from if you consider the other countries in other part of the world. And, but the good part is yes, we are catching up on those points. However, uh, more compliance it becomes more and more responsibility it comes uh, for the supply chain to ensure that you know, the uh, particular parameters are being met. And uh, because the uh, if you if you ignore those then the, the consequences pretty strong negative uh, consequence you can have on the company's well. So, <clears throat> there are a lot of, so it's, it's a risk basically and uh, as a supply chain I think it's not only about uh, the compliance for, for your own country that you are working into, you also have to understand the compliance about the other countries from where you are procuring the goods, okay, and uh, for the countries where you are exporting the goods, what are the compliance, what are the regulations they have, those countries have and uh, how it's going to impact you in your total supply chain part. So that is the more important part. Uh, however, monitoring on that, I would say it's uh, important to have a regular updates on the compliance, on the regulatory uh, updates that keeps coming up. And uh, well, there are there are particular softwares, there are agencies who keep providing you that. So if you have something, and uh, for a chemical company, if I say, then these are uh, more risky industries. Okay, so somebody, somebody or the industry should go with such type of uh, either for the softwares where they can have the regular updates or for the outside agencies who can give them the regular updates about these things. So is uh, safety a cost factor for you? Safety, yes, you can say it's a cost factor, but in long term, no, I would say. In the short term, yes, it's a cost, but in long term, no. It's a, it's a way of running the business and uh, it's it's built up your margin, if you see it in the long term. Arush, what about your uh, encompassing multiple uh, verticals actually? Uh, so safety, uh, what is the safety? Uh, so uh, so like, I, like I mentioned, then I actually agree with them. Uh, initially when you start the journey on safety, uh, or you take it up to the next level, you feel, okay, that's investment in time, money, even, even equipment, uh, depending on where you are. But uh, what it does is it forces you to look at uh, minute aspects uh, of the entire people process platform piece. And uh, it, it releases efficiency at each one of those levels or at least most of those levels. And then it can be a business or a corporate call as to whether you monetize that efficiency or not. 
but uh, our experience has been that uh, overall safety has led to efficiency and even cost coverage. Uh, Pratima, uh, you are in a different line of together, so I just want to bring the security issues with you. What are the security uh, risks and challenges that are faced in your supply chain? Uh, uh, moving on from the secure, safety part of it, Security. Yeah, so uh, even though I represent the IT distribution industry, I'm saying that whenever we talk about supply chain, so most of the safety security things are common, the generic items are common, and then you go deeper into uh, that industry, there will be certain specific things. So coming to IT distribution industry, uh, we actually cater services to uh, more than 1500 OEMs who manufacture these IT hardwares, and we help them distributing these goods to the market, to the resellers, etc. So for us, from a security point of view, the most important part is the data security uh, because at the end of the day, the OEMs are relying upon us in terms of maintaining safety and security of their data and the information. And uh, we, in turn, uh, take their products closer to the customer. Uh, we add value to their supply chain by doing this bit, but in the process, we need to be 100% sure that we are not um, you know, breaching the data safety anyway. So for us, if you ask me, that is the most important part. Apart from that, the other aspect of security, because we deal with products which are very, very high value. I mean, we might have a small 1,000 square feet warehouse which will be carrying inventory worth of these, uh, say, 100 crore. Uh, uh, now, that is another security aspect, which is safeguarding the inventory. What happens if something happens, some sort of pilferage or theft happen, it is not only a loss to us as an organization, but impacts the OEMs which we represent. So it, it impacts the trust level, it impacts their brand image in the market, saying that you are working with a service provider in whose place the safety security is not maintained. So yeah, so those are the two major things in our industry. Punit, we have seen a uh, solar wind cyber attack in US which destroyed uh, almost a uh, data of 200, 300 companies across the board in the US. Uh, even then, uh, we see the cyber uh, uh, security is still not a buzzword in India. What is your take on that? Yeah, that that's increasingly being appointed and observed by us. There's companies which have, uh, because cyber attacks been an existential crisis, as big names as Musk and uh, yes. uh, Spicejet recently in India, so these companies, so we've been taking this lightly, but I see this significantly increased awareness about it. There's a mandate, mandate from the company's uh, board that uh, Chief Information Security Officer has to be nominated. This is not important. So what becomes important now is, as you talk about security, it's not just a physical good security. The digital system security is an equally important thing. And banks, they've been uh, instrumental in creating awareness about the uh, mechanisms for ensuring that all the systems that you're using, they are timely patched, the your choice of systems in terms of what is the security stance of those things. You have to work with vendors who are compliant with the latest security standard like SOCS, SOCS compliance, and periodic VAPT testing and all that same things. One thing that I feel is uh, a concern remains is the in-house IT system. Most of the companies, they operate on in-house IT systems, and to harden those IT systems, it's quite difficult. Because security itself is a very challenging and expert required. So more and more people are moving towards outsourced systems which have specialist teams, which are, uh, kind of, I, I won't say they're bulletproof, but they're reasonably more protected than this. Because security is something which we cannot take lightly. And I would say that there's reasonably increased awareness. People have, uh, by virtue of listening to other people's uh, failure stories and challenges. Okay, because you gave an interesting thought. So people are moving away from their own uh, server to cloud. How secure uh, the cloud is because then you have a lot many people moving in. Uh, do we have, because India is talking about keeping the data within the country, data localization is a big uh, issue. So how does the cloud help it, uh, in that? Because most of the clouds are located outside India. Do we have secure cloud system uh, based in India? In most cloud providers today, they have presence in India. They set up, they understand India. India is a big market for all the big names in the country. So that's not an issue as much. And I would say we talk about how secure are these. Uh, security when talk about, you have to look at it in a, in a relative sense. No system can be termed as an absolutely unbreakable system. There are always 
tools which can be exploited. So what I believe is the, when you work with a large reputed provider, they would have much more mature practices. The property or the uh, chances of your system be getting breached are much lower if you're working with such a professional and expert provider who takes security, which is part of the uh, core uh, value proposition. Any question at this hour from the audience because uh, we don't want to uh, take the question at the end. Yeah. So my question comes more from the DG uh, products. Uh, I'm from Blue Dart and uh, quite a lot of industries who uh, handle uh, dangerous goods or TCL, temperature controlled goods, are often uh, using our services. One of the problems that uh, COVID has failed, uh, put on companies who are contract manufacturers for others is that they require now procedures where they hand over the shipment at the gate rather than at the cold storage. So what happens is if they are giving us a good away from their cold storage, it leads to a spike, a temperature spike, which can actually harm the nature of the good, the nature of the shipment and can cause a temperature explosion. Uh, such kind of SOP changes, my question is more generic now. Such kind of changes have a problem on the safety and security of a supply chain because the shipment can go through. What kind of solutions as supply chain providers do you uh, so, uh, give to customers when they have made a change which is risky for the dangerous good? I hope the question is uh, If you want to answer that, uh, I think the rest of them are basically uh, users of Yeah, I can take that question because in the past I have worked in uh, uh, chemical industry. So I know a little bit about the DG goods and uh, you are right, you are absolutely right that uh, that particular gap in terms of handing over the temperature sensitive shipments may impact on the quality of the product and later on as a service provider possibly the shipper will be making the uh, transporter or the carrier responsible then because of you. But having said that, uh, I think today technology is available. Technology is available which will actually tell you that at the time when you have picked up the shipment, what is the temperature and during the transit, what is the temperature maintained till the time you delivered. So even though there was a spike that happened at the initial stage, I think you as a service provider have got all the evidences to tell your shipper that I have received the goods, say it is supposed to be maintained at 4 to 8 degrees, when you have handed it over it was at 10 degrees. And from 10 degrees, then I maintain the temperature till the end uh, user. But yes, your point is right. Any changes that are happening in the process from the shipper industry, it is mandatory if they want a good service from the service provider, that the service, service provider has to be informed regarding the changes that are happening in the process. I do agree with that. Any other questions? So when it comes to QMS, what you are saying is it is more transactional, so for every transaction you inform the customer. Is there something that you can do as a preventive action to solve this kind of Because it's happening now regularly and across very senior and uh, responsible clients also. No, of course. I mean, you are right. I mean, it should not be transactional. It should be whenever there is a process change, a mega change is happening, all the service providers who are getting impacted because their service is going to get impact the quality of the product, final product that you ship it to your customer. So it is the owners on the shipper industry, on the shipping company that they need to inform the service provider regarding the changes in the process. I fully agree with you on that. I'll just supplement. Basically when uh, one is the fundamental, the process itself is not taking in consideration the practicality of operations. The best way would be to persuade the customer to review the uh, SOP just in case that's not possible. Which uh, then you have to do a uh, fix. Then you have to do a fix, and you have to, as I said, technology can come as a key player, uh, key uh, instrument to establish the accountability. So uh, SOP is the first thing, and then you patch about it. Patch about it. Yeah. So as a as a shipper. Uh, supply chain uh, manager for for a big company like mine, I would just not move uh, the shipment if I have not convinced it can be in safety to my customer or, or the location. I think there has been a sea change in uh, how uh, corporates look at safety and uh, our science has, has been in one or two occasions just that. 
Yeah, basically because when you're dealing with dangerous goods, there are uh, compliance uh, requirements already set in place and you need to follow them. And if, this is a, uh, if you are using temperature control, yeah, there is a, a challenge there. You have to work with the customer to find out the right uh, solution. They cannot be uh, one uh, size fits all type of a solution. It has to go uh, with a particular uh, product that you are really moving around. Uh, to go forward, uh, Arush, how can organization uh, ensure that proper safety protocols are maintained uh, during the transportation and logistics? Because you are moving thousands of trucks, uh, uh, there are people, uh, your drivers may be changing now after COVID. You see the situation where many people are not still reported back to work, they are scared uh, to come back to work. So how do you manage the safety protocol? True, man. The perennial sewing season does not help. But uh, uh, I think I think we, we have to look at uh, everything through the prism of people, process, and uh, platform. Uh, one major uh, part of my company is into uh, communication, etc. And I can tell you that we are uh, at the cusp, and we are not talking about five years, ten years, we are talking months. Major, you know, being, being able to access high quality data anywhere in India. And this is, uh, you know, we are all sitting at the edge of a major information revolution or a highway, uh, access to a highway. And as supply chain practitioners, we are not thinking as to how, what are the good use cases uh, that can happen uh, uh, with access to such kind of uh, data availability. Uh, and I, I personally believe that all the three aspects, which is people, uh, processes, whether they are on the ground or tracking or uh, uh, IoT of things, uh, blockchain, uh, they, they will all have enormous impact as, as to how we move uh, our goods daily. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, what you are trying to say is the lack of uh, data sharing or data collection, I would say rather for the first place, and data sharing among the industry player so that we can learn uh, what is happening. So, will uh, technology data analytics help there? Or? No, of course. Uh, so, first is data availability. Uh, the second is to have processes around the, the data availability. So, for example, how many of us do a very good uh, uh, real world paper based journey management uh, program? Even, even I would be happy if I did it. <laughs> right, you know. So, uh, data will help us implement journey management uh, easily. It will not be just a signed paper at the end of the journey. Uh, it could be verifiable, it could be tra trackable in a real time. Uh, uh, so, things like that. So, we, uh, data will enable us to do the manual things in a more visible, trackable, and repeatable manner. Uh, Dr. Uh, how would you uh, carry out uh, the risk assessment uh, uh, for your supply chain? Uh, and uh, what are the techniques that you would use because you are dealing with multiple uh, challenges actually, safety and security both. So how to, what type of sec uh, risk assessment you would really be carrying out? Okay, so uh, in terms of risk assessment, again, there are certain uh, generic processes and then industry-specific processes. Now, I'm sure that for uh, most of the industries, the process will go in a same manner, uh, which starts with, first of all, identification of your risks. Um, I've seen uh, some organizations doing a little bit hurry in the process. In terms of identifying the risk, I think most importance has to be given in that first process of identification. Otherwise, you might be surprised with certain risk which you never assess that this risk may come and uh, yes, you are bold. So, the first obviously is the identification and in the identification process, you need to consider all different elements of safety and security. Whether it is people, whether it is your asset, whether it is your data, whether it is your reputation. Everything needs to be considered and then the next step obviously you need to make a plan. So how that means a mitigation plan of how you are going to handle those risks in each of the cases. Along with that, another thing which is also important there which we do is the plan B. So that means if uh, 
a particular mitigation plan doesn't work, do you have a plan B? For businesses, one very important aspect under safety and security is I think the business continuity plan. So the business continuity plan should not be a different thing uh, when you are working on the uh, risk assessment. It has to go side by side. So if something happens and my mitigation plan doesn't work, what is the next plan, plan B that I have? Because otherwise you have a very less opportunity to respond. There are organizations within the timely response if they could not able to take. I mean, it may, the organization goes completely out of the business. There's a huge competition that is there in the market. So I think that's the approach that we do follow. And uh, the last thing is obviously employee training. Whatever risk assessment you have done, whatever uh, plans that you have made, each and everyone in an organization, depending on the role that they have, they need to know their accountability in that particular uh, mitigation plan. Because otherwise, at a management level, you may have a very good rule book. But if the person who is working on the floor doesn't know what I need to do if A, this thing happens, then it is of no use. It's only a rule book, that's all. So I think, yes, uh, these are the steps that we do follow. And I'm sure most of the organizations follow the same process. Uh, how would you, uh, as an organization, uh, selecting the vendor, especially the logistics service provider, uh, look at when selecting the, uh, them in terms of the safety and security protocol? Is there an established method that you look at? Are they complying with the requirements? Or what is the uh, system that you follow when you are uh, selecting your third party vendors? We are talking transporters, we are talking warehousing companies, uh, all sort of things. Of course, I think uh, nothing different. Uh, we do uh, same standards we follow what the other chemical industries follow. So in terms of uh, warehousing, we normally see that uh, the service provider is uh, uh, well experienced in handling the chemicals. And what type of chemicals they have been uh, handled, what class of chemicals they have handled, they have enough sufficient force to uh, handle those uh, chemicals. That's one. The warehouse is well equipped to handle the chemicals. So the chemical warehouses are a bit different than the private warehouses. Okay, you need to have a different space for the has to store the has chemicals and everything. So we ensure that those things are there. Okay, and uh, for has chemicals, they have a proper cautionary measures like the sprinklers are there, the fume, uh, the foam uh, spreaders are there. So those things has to be there before we do that. So there is a safety audit that has been done before selecting any warehouse or the warehouse uh, service providers. We do the we go to their different warehouses that they are existing and running on that, and we do the proper audit for those how they are maintained. And similarly for the uh, transportations, yes, the transportation I would again differentiate between two. One is for transporting the has chemicals, and other for. Uh, uh, the normal, the normal metals which are not as one. So, has as Arush had said, you know, we need to need to have the transportations and the uh, the trucks are different. The, the tankers are different of, for those because those are peso controls and all those things. So, we need to have the certificates of those things. Uh, ensure that you know those certificates are valid certificates. They are not expired one week or anything. So, those things are we take care of. What are the uh, what do you see as a future trend uh, in the supply chain uh, safety and security issues, which uh, uh, the IT can solve or software application can solve for the industry? So when we talk about safety and security, when I look at uh, into three, four, I break it down to multiple parts. One is security and safety within the premise, within your premise and outside the premise, and then within the organization boundary and outside the organization boundary. So within the premise, but I've seen uh, technology is going to be instrumental in everything because uh, of the kind of video analytics that are now possible, gesture recognition, those kind of things. The so point is, we have to give real-time feedback. If safety is done as an after-effect or as a post-mortem, it doesn't uh, uh, take you that far. Alerts, right, real-time alerts, control towers where the moment an incident is happening, and, the, uh, and the, it's a human behavior, if you get an immediate feedback, that's when it gets embedded in your muscle memory. So idea is uh, safety. Still, I see most of uh, bearing a few most of the organizations they still see it as a compliance. I would say safety should not be compliance. Safety has to be a DNA. It's a way of being in the organization, and that would be uh, flowed through 
uh, real-time instance feedback and what the uh, statement of the management like the European companies that you work with, they have such high standards, even single, not even fatality, even the normal accident has to be reported to the CEO. Those kind of drive from top down about sensitivity and safety has to come in and technology is going to play a very, very important role. Uh, artificial intelligence, generative AI and uh, video analytics, these are going to be key levers. So is India ready for higher level uh, implementation of compliance in health and safety Arush? Uh, what we see in UK, you mentioned US, okay, uh, of course we have ISO 45000 in there but uh, that is more like uh, uh, some quality standard you picked up but not to be implemented. So do you think real compliance uh, uh, at higher level uh, going to happen because everything is controlled over there right from the working hours of the uh, truck operator, uh, the forklift operator, warehouse operator, so, everybody. So there are, there are two levels to that. So I will not address the, the ESG debate that is happening no, globally. We are not there. Yeah, yeah. We are not there. We are not there. Yes. But, I see no option uh, uh, for companies at least like mine uh, but to uh, move in that direction. And uh, like I've said before, our experience so far is that we are on that side of the curve where uh, things, these things are releasing efficiency in the system. For example, uh, uh, a simple thing like uh, we have implemented uh, compulsory half an hour check for uh, for a driver after every three hours, so 30 minute compulsory rest time after every so electronically, digitally monitored and implemented. Our uh, per day journey uh, kilometers covered has gone up by 30 percent. So we we are we when I say this and I say this very responsibly that we are uh, every safety step has released some kind of efficiency. Let me share with you some more figures and you'll think that I'm talking about operations. For example, we've reduced the size of our fleet by about 17%. We've increased our uh, loaded kilometers by about 14%. We have a far younger fleet that we used to say three, three years ago. All this because we did a safety implementation program. <laughs> yeah, uh, Vishal, you want to add to that? No, no, I, I, I can say that Reliance is having a really good safety standards for that. What Arush was saying that about these things, we, we buy a, a chemical from uh, Reliance, and it's, it's a uh, particular chemical, it's a hazardous chemical, and what he's saying is like you know, after three hours, every three hours there's a break, they have a monitoring system, you know, if if, even if the tanker is uh, standing outside my premises for more than an hour, I get the call from Reliance why it was happening while the tanker is standing there, why it's not being taken inside. So, uh, safety standards are pretty high for that. So, okay. so, I would like to add a, a little comment there. So, I am sure most of the large companies are very, very serious and have very uh, strong process of uh, implementing safety standards. So when you ask that whether India is ready or not. Uh, but there is another part of India also. I mean, if you look into the statistics, we have huge number of MSMEs. So whether India is ready, I think we should look at it from an MSME lens, whether they are ready or not. Uh, still, most of the MSMEs work uh, from a cost and profit perspective only. Uh, so I think uh, as large organizations, uh, one of the roles that large organizations have to play is uh, when they are working with those MSMEs, help them with the right guidance, right training, what they need to do. I remember one of the incidents in my previous organization being a chemical company that uh, one of the, uh, when we used to uh, actually sign up a customer who will be a reseller of a chemical, we used to do an audit. And I'm sure all the big companies do the same process. Now, in that audit, uh, we have found out a completely different picture the way we look at safety and the way that customer looks at the safety, you know. For your uh, chemical synthesis, there has to be a separate room. That's what I understand. You know, that room has to be fireproofed and everything. Uh, but in the name of a room, they only put a green carton. So, and on the other side of the carton, there are certain hazardous chemicals that are being dealt with. So for them, the entire focus was, okay, 
you wanted a separation, I have done a separation at the lowest cost possible because I need to save up my margin also. So I think that's where uh, we need to focus. Larger companies are doing, there is no question regarding that. But as far as the MSME sector is concerned, to what extent large companies can support, government can support, that's where the answer lies whether it is ready or not. <laughs> Good one. Any questions from the audience? Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Raja Kumar from RT Suzuki. So I have one question. For safe supply chain operations, warehouse manpower safety is also important. But many times people bypass safety also. So have you gone through any best practices regarding behavioral safety also? So what we are doing as a uh, uh, as okay. So my mind warehouse is, a, is an external warehouse. Okay, but what we do is we consider them as a part of our own organizations. Okay, and we ensure that the proper safety is being followed in the warehouses as well. So we normally we have a practice that every day. Okay, there's a five minutes or ten minutes session on the safety when the whole world starts. The whole idea is to induce the safety culture or the safety mind or to bring the safety mindset within the employees. But I think the safety, uh, the incident can be avoided, okay, only by the person itself. You can have a number of, uh, uh, you know, the best facilities you can have. But if the culture is not there for the safety, you cannot avoid any incidents to happen. So it is the culture, it's the mindset which you have to do. And so in the uh, five minutes or 10 minutes session that we uh, have in the morning before starting the work, we almost, sorry, we always make them aware that what the hazardous is, what is the potential risk to their health, you know, so that they know what they are handling and they have to be safe handling for these things. So that's one. And secondly, we have a monthly training on the safety of the full pitch, the full day training on this part. So we try to, you know, put that culture, bring that culture within the warehouses. Let, let me let me add to that uh, to what Vishal was saying. So obviously, training training is a kosher. It's the first step. You have to train uh, uh, the the people that you're deploying in the warehouses. Uh, my counterparts of the solid side run about 67 warehouses across uh, the country in petrochemicals. Uh, I can tell you how we deploy technology. So, for example, you know, I think one of the service partners in Antioch, they have a few other uh, related uh, verticals also. Uh, one of the technologies uh, that is available is uh, reading video feed. And uh, you can actually uh, monitor uh, mishaps, uh, uh, non-standard uh, behavior, Loading behavior or unloading behavior, uh, uh, non-standard practices uh, from a simple video view. Whatever the eye can see, you can have uh, uh, programs which will read uh, read it better, faster, more accurately, and come up with uh, real-time violations. And then you can have processes around those violations across your warehouses uh, to improve. Uh, safety and uh, uh, behavior so yeah because the behavior change can only happen through training and it's not training is not just one off activity uh, many companies make a mistake that they say how many training kar liya training ho gaya tumhara quota khatam ho gaya that's not uh, how it works when you have to change behavior especially when it comes to safety and security requirement it has to be consistent throughout the year safety not only by uh, training but also collecting data and assembling the data and discussing the data with the people there and giving them the uh, uh, justification as to why this is important. Then only once that culture gets into it, and then what I want to ask my panelists is where the culture comes from, ground level or from the top? From the top. So that's very obvious because if we don't show safety culture at the top level, I don't think anybody is going to follow you. Okay, so. Uh, and behavior happens if there is zero tolerance for risky behavior in the organization. Yeah. So first, uh, uh, finally, one last thought from all of you all on the uh, safety and security aspect in the supply chain. What should organization do? 
to make sure they uh, comply and remain safe. So, I'll begin. So, I believe, as, as you just mentioned, that safety, the journey or the point starts from the top. And it's a continuum. We, as a range of organizations, there are different levels of maturity. There are the trends that set, set the highest benchmarks and the things percolate down the line. So we have a long journey to cross. India, as you said, is India ready for safety? It's not about ready, it's a necessity. We are one of the largest, most populous organizations. So we have to level up. So it's a journey. We would be step by step going there. So I, one thing that I strongly believe is technology besides awareness. Awareness is there. But still, as humans, we are most of the times not conscious. We are operating in our subconscious mind. So the way technology has become more affordable uh, with AI and video analytics, Arushi mentioned about uh, unsafe behavior being automatically pointed out. We have seen plants where uh, uh, if, a vehicle, if a person is moving without a helmet, it will immediately cause an alert and security would immediately charge on that person. If the person is moving in on not on the designated walkways, then again it's immediately uh, pointed out. These things they have to be adopted, and good part is it's become a lot more affordable these days. I'm very excited about the future safety. We would be fast tracking the journey quite uh, as we progress. Can I agree with you? And as we all agree, that's a top-down bottom uh, top-down approach. So the one thing is like uh, I, I always believe that. Uh, be a role model. Okay, so in front of your employees or your team members, even to the warehouse guys who are on the contracts, even show them that safety is important even for you as well. It's not like only they have to do it; you have to walk the talk, basically. And emphasis on the training and the regular uh, updates on the on the uh, these things. So one of the uh, um, uh, if, uh, one of the uh, the practice that we are following here is. Uh, rewarding the one who is uh, finding out the unsafe activities. Okay, so there's a motivation for the people to identify with what is the unsafe activity and we try to immediately eliminate those, those things. So it's like everyone is alert, everyone is aware, you know, what are the unsafe activities and they are trying to see if this everything is there. Yeah, so the uh, question on what organizations should do, Obviously, the first thing is to bring a safety culture. That is the most important and that is the most difficult part of it. Because uh, uh, gentlemen asked that question, that how do you uh, create that behavior, right? I mean, that, is, that has got a direct relationship with the kind of safety culture you are creating. It's not a one-day program that uh, you've created a program, you've trained your people and that tick box is, it is checked and then it's done. It's a daily activity. And all of us know that uh, organizations talk about safety is everyone's responsibility. It's not only the responsibility of the EHS department, so as to say. But in practice, whether it is happening or not. So you can have methodology of soft and hard. Soft in the sense that, as uh, he has also mentioned, that if somebody is doing a uh, showcasing a good behavior, then reward that person immediately so that others can see that, uh, see, I mean, if I do this, then it is getting rewarded. Second is also you need to check that in your organization have you created that kind of an atmosphere where people feel safe to talk about safety. So sometimes that also happens in organizations because there is a manager who wants to showcase that in my area everything is safe. So he will not allow his team members to talk about any unsafe when a higher official visits his workplace. So this is also part of the culture. So that's where I think, as you have, all of you have rightly mentioned, that it's a top-down approach. Uh, the foremost thing that is important is what is the perspective of the management, whether they are really ready to walk that hard path towards creating a safety culture. It's a hard path because sometimes it also comes as a choice between uh, whether you are going to spend that money here or spend that money in the market. So that choice will come. So that will talk about the higher management's perspective towards safety. So yes, in, the, in those areas, if uh, proper actions are taken, and uh, if you really spend your heart and soul into creating a proper safety culture, that's what will uh, uh, you know, help you realize the true purpose of uh, uh, creating a safety management system or something like that. I think, I think safety is, uh, is a hygiene factor. Either you are safe or you are not safe. 
I think what COVID showed was it's not good enough being agile. I think uh, your supply chain is being nothing if you're not safe. So uh, basically, uh, safety and security issue is now very, very critical uh, for the supply chain because of the ability to create massive risk. A risk is not uh, just about some property damage, it's about loss of human life and also brand and reputational loss. Okay, and you see up to number of time customers are not willing to work, uh, buy products or services of those companies which they consider are uh, having unethical practices where they are violating safety and security norms. And this is very, very important for every organization. This is now a board level discussion that is happening across the uh, uh, industry. So thank you so much to the panel members for a wonderful discussion. And thank you audience for bearing with us. Uh, I know it's lunch time, so I'll leave it to the hand over. Thank you, RG sir, for being so precise and concise, all the panelists, and wrapping the session well before time, which is actually commendable that you guys have conveyed the message in the shortest way possible. Uh, I would like to call Charu on stage to felicitate all of you, please.